Good afternoon. I'm Immaculata DeVivo, co-director of the Life Science Program here at Radcliffe Institute, and I want to welcome you to our continuing series of virtual Radcliffe Book Talks, exploring recent publications whose subjects or authors have a connection with the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. The 2023 summer series will begin with Dr. Anne Christine Duhame. Dr. Duhame is the Nicholas T. Zarvis Distinguished Professor of Neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School and at the Mass General Hospital. She's also the Associate Director of the Mass General Center for the Environment and Health. She's a board certified uh, pediatric neurosurgeon, neurosurgeon and deeply interested in environmental issues and their relationship between the brain and behavior. Tina, as she likes to be called by her friends, is also a former fellow of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. And it was during this time that she wrote the book that we feature today, Minding the Climate, How Neuroscience Can Help Solve Our Environmental Crisis. And this is actually quite timely given that one of the a focus area at the Radcliffe Institute is climate change programming. So I'd like to take a moment um, to briefly introduce the book because there will be a, a bigger discussion today. But I was struck by Bill McKibben, a renowned American environmentalist, author and journalist who has written extensively on the impact of global warming and praised Tina's book for linking neuroscience and environmental studies. He wrote that this book, quote, offers insights into how we might leverage our brains to fight climate change. As I read the book, I was reminded of the quote by the very um, famous geneticist Theodosius Dubonsky, who famously wrote, quote, nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution, end of quote. It's taken to mean that the structure of living organisms only makes sense when viewed as a set of evolutionary adaptations to specific selection pressures. Dr. Duhaime skillfully guides the reader to understand how the evolutionary process shaped human brains long before humans appeared. <laughs> So how the brain's reward system was designed for short-term decision-making. But, but the conclusion is very hopeful because she reminds us that humans are not fixed in stone. We are malleable and we have the capacity to change. Dr. Duhame's reading will be followed by a discussion with Sharon Weinberger, National Security and Foreign Policy Editor at the Wall Street Journal. She has held fellowships at the Radcliffe Institute where Tina and Sharon became friends. She was also a fellow at MIT's Knight Science Journalism Program, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the International Reporting Project at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and Northwestern University's Medal School of Journalism. She has written on military science and technology for, you know, well-known publications, the New York Times, the New York Magazine, Washington Post, Financial Times, Wired Magazine, Nature, BBC, among other publications. But before I turn to today's program, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and our annual donors who are watching this afternoon. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. For today's program, we are especially grateful to Elaine Cotel Binder's Dean's Fellow Leadership Fund for Academic Ventures, which is supporting the event. And finally, a few words about audience participation. We encourage those watching on Zoom to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions at any time during the program. And the speakers will address as many as they can. Since we anticipate a lot of questions, we ask that you keep them short and this will enable them to address as many as possible as we have. It is now my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Dr. Anne Christine Duhaime, who will offer a brief reading from the introduction of the book before engaging in conversation with Sharon Weinberger. Tina, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mac, and thank you to the Radcliffe Institute for uh, this opportunity. I chose this reading from the middle of the introduction, so there are some uh, livelier stories before this, but uh, the, this section is called The Case for the Brain, and that's what it makes, the case for um, looking at climate change through the lens of the brain. Climate change is an enormous multifaceted problem, and it goes without saying that different disciplines frame the problem and its potential solutions 
from the perspective of that field. Engineers perceive a design problem. Economists see markets and resources. Environmental scientists find answers in heat sinks and ice cores. Social scientists recognize information flow and group inequities. Each field makes critical contributions to understanding and attempting to find solutions. Much of the research on behavior change relevant to the environment comes from the field of psychology with investigators often working in concert with economists and researchers from other disciplines. While classic psychology experiments study behavior observed within a specific time and circumstance, related and overlapping approaches in neuroscience investigate how the nervous system works at the level of cells, molecules, and genes. Psychology describes behavior in specific situations, while neuroscience provides complementary insights into how consistent or malleable behavior may be based on the plasticity and adaptability inherent in the brain's very design. Whether shifts in behavior are likely to be an effective tool in the climate change battle can be answered only by knowing the environmental impact of specific behaviors, the flexibility of people to make different choices, and the likelihood that enough people might be influenced to change their behavior in a particular direction. Neuroscience historically has not turned much of its attention to climate change, but the field is steeped in the study of behaviors that are relevant to this problem. Clinicians practicing in neuroscience-based specialties deal routinely with disorders that involve adaptive and abnormal goal-directed behaviors, the influence of experience and neural plasticity on brain function, and other manifestations of the intersection of brain and behavior. Building on painstaking work in basic neuroscience, they treat drives that are out of balance, excessive in addictions, dysfunctional after damage to motivation and reward networks, and require strategies for behavior change. As one striking example, patients with Parkinson's disease whose medication doses or deep brain stimulators to control tremors are turned up too high may become compulsive gamblers or shoppers. These disorders shed light on the circuitry and modulation of healthy and pathologic brain networks that influence the drive to consume. In other contexts, clinicians observe daily the amazing resiliency of the human complement of drives and motivations honed also by millions of years of nervous system evolution. Humans are rewarded by agency, the sense of accomplishment afforded by successfully completing a task. Agency almost, always, almost, always, almost certainly drove John Holter to take matters into his own hands and find a tangible solution to a problem of exceeding personal importance described earlier in the chapter. But as we will see, perceiving agency from climate change action is a more difficult neural challenge. Other brain mediated rewards are similarly critical to the human story. Social rewards are among the most powerful ever identified. And children are especially rewarded when fulfilling their innate drive to explore, learn, and experience. Even after major surgery, what children want most is to go to the playroom and seek out toys. Distraction by novelty, most recently by iPads in the recovery room, has been shown to be more effective than narcotics for reducing pain. There are data demonstrating that exposure to nature is rewarding but that this reward differs in fundamental ways from that of acquisition and consumption. We will explore these neural traits in more detail to learn what factors facilitate different types of behavior change, including those that might have environmental consequences. This book arose from a particular journey through the topic of environmentally relevant behavior from the perspective of a brain-focused clinician scientist, specifically in the field of neurosurgery. Not surprisingly, people in this field tend to think everything is about the brain, but is that useful? From a brain-centric point of view, behavior-related problems like climate change reflect the design of the equipment we use to interact with and influence the world. Solutions may be enhanced by taking into account an explosion of new insights from neuroscience on how this equipment works at a fundamental level and how it is or isn't suited to the various responses at hand. Thus, this exploration attempts to address from a neurobiologic point of view, whether insights from the intersection of neuroscience and behavior 
can help inform strategies to promote individual and collective change during the brief period of time available to alter our global trajectory. From the lens of neuroscience, decisions are arbitrated by the brain's reward system with inputs from a wide variety of internal and external influences. The brain's decisions and priorities are not predetermined by genes or some unalterable program, and they differ from person to person. Our neural equipment is exquisitely designed to respond to changing conditions, but with certain predispositions and limitations. Understanding the evolutionary uh, design and workings of the brain's reward system in decision making can help us understand the choices humans tend to make in the environmental realm, and most importantly, how malleable these choices may be. While we have some common tendencies to behave in certain ways, we also are engineered to be different from one another by design, as this works best for societal problem solving and survival. In addition, our neural design includes the traits of being highly adaptable to specific types of new circumstances, though there are some strategies that can be called on to make us adapt more easily. Which behaviors contribute the most to environmental harm? What works and doesn't work to change behavior and why? How fixed or flexible is the decision-making apparatus of the human brain? How does the way we live in current times intersect with our inherited equipment to make things even worse? And finally, if the reward system is an important mediator for behavior affecting climate change, we should be able to create a test case for this hypothesis. Specifically, can we successfully influence decision makers at an institutional level to make pro-environmental behavior more likely by making it more rewarding? I'd now like to bring Sharon Reinberger into the conversation to uh, lead the discussion, Sharon. Ina, it is so great to be here, even virtually, because I think it was um, maybe almost seven years ago um, that I was sitting in your office and trying to understand why I bought so many pairs of seemingly similar black boots that all look suspiciously the same. <laughs> and you were able to explain using neuroscience why sort of the joy wears off with one pair of shiny new shoes and then you move on to the next. But it, it, as I was reading your book, it, it was both, you know, it was both fun to think back to that and also embarrassing because I think like most people who have read some of the, the popular literature on neuroscience, most of it is about how do we get skinnier, richer, more popular. It is about that neuroscience and the individual decision making. And I think what is so unique and wonderful about your book is looking at that collective decision making. But that's also the, the challenge. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, if I uh, try to mold my brain to make better decisions on eating, on drinking, on different things, or on financial decisions, I can see that immediate reward, but you're trying to think about how to incentivize people to make decisions for things that may have very little or no impact on them directly. Can you talk more about the challenges of that, of that individual versus the collective? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Um, I remember those black boot discussions as well, so it's a lot of fun for me to be here and have this conversation with you. Um, that's a common difficulty when people hear about this idea of using the brain and neuroscience to approach this big, big, big complicated issue of climate change. Because people have a tendency to think that if we're talking about the brain, we're talking about personal decisions and we're talking about personal decisions that affect your own life. And the point that I try to make uh, throughout the book, uh, because it's been the source of a lot of confusion, is to recognize that while we make decisions one brain at a time, it's the only way we can make decisions is one brain at a time. Uh, we can be influenced by other people for sure. That's what goes into the decision-making. But the decisions that we make can have influence far beyond our own personal lives. And so the scope of the effect of a particular change in the equation um, and therefore in the, the outcome of a particular decision is all over the map. It's not just that I make a decision in my brain so it only affects my life. If you are 
the CEO of a company, if you are a middle manager, if you are an educator, if you are the head of a family, if you are a friend among many friends, the way that you change your own equation about how to make decisions that are relevant to this big problem of climate change can affect many other people. So it's one thing to, as you say, uh, have the self-help attitude. You know, I'm going to use neuroscience to influence and affect my own life for my own gain. But the point of this approach uh, is that no matter what scale or with what impact any decision is made, um, it's still made the same way, whether it's done for a self-help reason, whether it's done for a selfish reason, whether it's done for an altruistic reason, whether it's done for an economic reason, it's never done for any one reason. The book goes through that decision-making is so complex that most of what influences our decision is well below any level of conscious um, uh, input. And therefore, the point is that the scale of the scope of a decision is all over the map. It's not just about your personal life and your own self-help. Well, let's take it to something, uh, another very current issue beyond climate change. So we're now coming out, you know, three years on out of the pandemic, which had some of those same questions uh, behind it. How do we encourage individual decisions um, that encourage the collective good. I'm curious when you looked at, at the pandemic, did you see things where perhaps neuroscience could have informed better choices, perhaps for policymakers, how to speak to people, how to sort of carry messages, how to help them make those decisions? Sure. And this is true in your field too of, you know, foreign affairs and international relations. Communication is key. And how you get information and the way information is framed, it, it, there's a whole science to what is the most effective way to change someone's mind or be persuasive. And this is true no matter what the topic is. Um, you know, I, I know you know this as well as anybody. Part of the difficulties that we have in society currently is the polarization of opinion because people get their information from different streams. And uh, as soon as you segregate what people see as the truth, um, people's opinions become more disparate. So people's opinions, of course, are based on many, 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 many factors, as I said, many of which are not conscious, but there are some basic principles that were applicable to the pandemic and are applicable to climate change. Uh, one example is you people in general um, tend to trust information that comes from people that they know. And so if your neighbor, if someone in your uh, community, if someone that goes to school with you, if someone is at your workplace, if somebody is at your house of worship, whatever, if information comes from somebody you know, you tend to um, uh, be more convinced by it than if it comes from a stranger. This is one of the big problems for anything that is scientific, whether it's about the pandemic, you know, it's about a health crisis, or it's about climate change, which, let's face it, most of us don't have a whole lot of education in, a whole lot of experience in, and we don't even have collective history to go back to because this has never happened before. So we rely um, on getting information from usually, most of us, from strangers, whom we don't know, who aren't in our community, and with whom we don't have much in common. So it's unrelatable. Uh, there's there's no you know historical texts, uh, uh, cultural you know echoes to go back to. So this was true for the pandemic uh, to an extent. Um, although even the pandemic, I think people had a somewhat easier time because it was an illness, and most of us have some experience directly or indirectly with similar types of illnesses in general. Climate change is even harder because your information has come from ex experts you don't understand or have knowledge of uh, or education in the science. Why should you? Um, and so we're expecting you to believe this from you know talking heads on some television screen on a channel you don't watch. So the pandemic and climate change had some similar parallels in the difficulty with convincing people uh, because of those factors. Mm -hmm. 
And then, of course, one of the things in the book is you talk about your own experience with the concept of a green hospital, of trying to convince people in your own circles to embrace this concept. Can you talk a little bit about the concept and some of the barriers you've faced in trying to get other people to buy into it? Sure. Um, the green hospital was a test case. And um, the idea was that I believed at the time that um, we had at the hospital that I work at um, some opportunities to coalesce and um, facilitate uh, systems of care for children by having all the children cared for in a physically contiguous space. Many hospitals in the country, in fact, most hospitals in the country have moved to this direction. Uh, I work at a, a superb uh, hospital. I have a privilege of working at you know, one of the best hospitals in the country. Um, and I felt that we could provide care that was uh, uh, even, even had some additional advantages if we had a physical space where all the kids were cared for all the time and all the systems were, were focused on, on children. Um, the model that we uh, uh, still have and had at the time that I came up with this idea was a more scattered model where children were physically in small areas, uh, but um, uh, situated within a physical space that was largely uh, uh, given to adult care. Uh, so my, idea of combining a pro-environmental um, idea with this idea of what I thought would would facilitate um, and you know sort of a, a of an enhancement of care was to create something that was unique and that might appeal to the decision making of people who make leadership decisions in in academic medical centers like mine and what kinds of things, if you weren't necessarily convinced that climate change was sort of part of your uh, job description, what kind of things might be part of your job description that might appeal um, for your decision-making to go in a pro-environmental or pro-climate change direction? So the idea was, well, what do people in you know, high prestige academic medical centers care about? They wanna be the first, they wanna be the best, they want to be the first to do something innovative. They want to be the only one that's done it this way. These sorts of rewards appeal to people in leadership positions in institutions that um, like to consider themselves at the very top. And so let's say you don't believe in climate change. And as you know, this was some years ago. And, and even since then, luckily, I think that the opinion of the general public has changed. Um, so the climate change is, is, a, is a more acceptable reality for more people. But at that time, um, the, it, we were, even though it wasn't that many years ago, the general public's opinion was not fully uh, as far along as it is now. And so in order to create a children's hospital of the kind I wanted, I wanted to create a first of its kind. Nobody's ever done it like this before. Um, prototype. And I wanted to create a hospital as a living laboratory for the most environmentally advanced um, uh, technologies that were available, but also for those people who really were not into climate change, didn't necessarily believe in it. I wanted to also make it such a, an appealing and attractive hospital apart from the issue of climate change that it couldn't help but be attractive. And so there was the sort of climate change side, technologically advanced, net zero energy, prototype first of its kind, learn new ways. Hospitals are very energy intense and to deliver care sustainably with net zero energy and so forth is a real challenge. It's, a, it's an innovation challenge. But to make it attractive to people who didn't even think climate change was an issue, I wanted to make it absolutely at the pinnacle full of nature. So the nature part was the carrot. And I wanted this hospital to be so green, not just in the environmental um, efficiency uh, metric, but green like nature, like absolutely beautiful, chock full of nature. Um, because I thought that the evidence suggested from my research that 
um, most people agreed and that the evidence was strong that being in a natural environment full of you know natural elements was soothing for children it was less frightening and it was soothing for their families their caregivers and even the healthcare providers and you know people uh, in the health professions so the idea of this green children's hospital experiment was could i get the leadership of my hospital to do something pro-environmental, make the world's first net zero children's hospital um, and, and create it as a living laboratory for technologies for sustainable delivery of healthcare by appealing to being first, being innovative, and also appealing to the general public, appealing to the staff, appealing to the patients and families, and appealing to hospital leadership by also making it so beautiful and so distinctive that I had a metric of success as my uh, bench, benchmark. And that metric was, if the duck boat tours don't point this hospital out, this new green children's hospital on their tours, we have failed. It has to be so distinctive and so beautiful and so full of nature and also so pro-environmental, but you can put that aside if that's not what you believe in, um, uh, that, um, you know, I, I was hoping that I could convince potential donors or I could convince hospital leadership for lots of different reasons, for things that people in these kinds of positions and decision-making uh, capacities might find rewarding um, to, to align. And that was the experiment. How far could we get with this Green Children's Hospital idea by appealing to things that different decision-makers would find rewarding? That was the, that was the challenge. And to do that, I had to think about what do people in these kinds of decision-making capacities typically find rewarding? Being first, being only, being the best, all of the things, you know, providing the best care, being the healthiest, um, and being the most distinctive. So that was the challenge. And that's what we tried. And what were the lessons you learned from that? Well, it was fascinating, Sharon. Um, I learned that the principles of appealing to what's rewarding to decision makers um, generally worked. That um, you needed to be in alignment. You needed to know what it was that they were rewarded for by the people that rewarded them. Almost everybody has somebody above them, <laughs> whether it's your board of trustees, you know, if you're if you're a department chair, it's, you know, the, the head of the hospital. If you're the head of the hospital, it's the board of trustees. There's almost everybody that gets something that comes down from the top um, that they are rewarded for. And it was really very interesting to look at look at it this way. Now it turned out that, of course, not unexpectedly, uh, at that point in time. There were many, many competing priorities for these people. They, they, they have to worry about, I mean, healthcare is a tough business and they have to worry about many, many things, their finances, their reputation, the care they deliver, their innovation, their being on the cutting edge. They have to worry about many, many things in this difficult, difficult business. But while we didn't get all the way to the Green Children's Hospital, um, nobody has said no but nobody has said yes. What we did do was, I believe, when I say we, I mean my collaborators and I, we were able to, to tip the needle. I really do believe that many factors, like in all decisions, many factors coalesced to tilt the needle of key decision makers and key you know, general population of people in the healthcare professions where I work. Uh, during those years, the needle has tilted. So now we have a Center for the Environment and Health. It is you know, funded by the hospital. There's a, a number of us clinicians that nobody used to talk about climate change and health. These, these conversations were not on people's minds. People didn't, early on in this adventure of mine, people didn't really think that climate change was part of healthcare or concern about health. And so the needle has shifted. Now, did the Green Children's Hospital Project do it in and of itself? No. But the point is, every decision that we make, every, um, every change in behavior, change in priorities happens because of thousands and thousands of little weights that enter into your decision-making um, 
uh, mechanism and hearing things over and over, hearing more people talking about things, uh, being persuaded by facts, being persuaded by emotion, all of these things weigh people's decisions. So what I learned uh, from the Green Children's Hospital Project is you don't always get all the way where you wanna go. You don't always get there fast enough. I think climate change is an existential crisis. I don't think we can get there fast enough to try to solve the problem. But everything you do affects other people and affects their decisions and affects how their brains weigh um, the factors that they use to come to the next decision they have to make. And it can affect people in ways you won't even know about. There can be ripple effects and so forth. So I do believe that the tide is turning for climate change, that hospital leadership around the country and around the world uh, has uh, taken this charge on in good faith. Um, during that time, we created a new journal, the Journal of Climate Change and Health. So all of these things, you know, gradually build up uh, and conversations about a green children's hospital or healthcare sustainability are no longer considered strange and weird, even in that very short period of time. So let's talk about some of the individual choices made, because I think for a lot of people, that's where it gets fascinating because we're used to thinking, okay, if I can rewire my brain not to buy the extra pair of boots or not to go gambling or not to drink, I'll get good things. But you talk about examples in this book like the person who decides they're going to take public transportation, it might add half an hour each way under their day or however long. How do you get the brain to see the reward um, on those sorts of things? It's not that necessarily that you get richer, thinner, more popular. It is something more collective. Yeah. You know, one of the principles of behavior change, I, I, I didn't invent any of this. What I did was look into what was known about behavior change on the level of um, be, you know, behavior psychology and difficult behavior change in public health contexts. Uh, and I looked at it from the point of view of what is the brain capable of? And so um, when you talk about uh, you know, difficult behavior change like addiction or difficult behavior change like, uh, you know, consumption, it isn't so much that um, you train your brain to, to do something different. Uh, it's that your equation changes and you can, you know, you can argue about whether these are conscious choices or they're, it's free will. You can get into all sorts of arguments about that. But for example, the, the case that you give of somebody deciding to take public transportation, one of the principles of behavior change that's been shown in contexts like difficult behavior change, like addiction, certain contexts of education, is that it works better to not do without things, but to substitute different things. That's one of the principles. So the example in the book about public transportation is, you know, it, it's an anecdote. This was a true story, actually. Uh, most, most everything in the book is a true story. Um, uh, I uh, take the train oftentimes, and I can remember having conversations with people on the train, and the, the book uses, paraphrases some of this. She said, I wouldn't go any other way. I started because my car was in the shop, but once I got into the routine, I can read a book when I go you know, on the way in, I have to walk to my office, but I get my steps in. I wouldn't do it any other way now. So psychologists call this changing habits and um, a habit in the neuroscience point of view from animal research and, and other kinds of research, single cell recordings, all kinds of neuroscience things that are in the book in more detail. Um, the word habit is used in different contexts, but basically it's it's things that you do the same way most of the time without thinking about them. They're sort of automatic. And once you get into a new habit, a new way of doing things, that becomes normal for you. That becomes routine. It's the decision to make the change that is sometimes difficult. And what has been shown in difficult behavior change is substituting one set of rewards for those that you're giving up works much better than saying, I should do this, I should do that. You know, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions as people say. And, um, you know, you can't just say, I think I'll stop eating 
this, or I think I, just deciding to do it doesn't work well, but substituting something different works much better. That's one of the basic principles of behavior change. So it's not so much that you have to train your brain to like this instead of that. It's that, you know, if climate change, for example, is important to you, um, you know, you may need to factor that in to new habits that you make a conscious decision to do. If you're trying to influence other people, you may need to, um, you know, find a way like we did with the Green Children's Hospital that what it is that you think people could do that would be preferable uh, is substituted for what they're doing now and has reward value. So, you know, you might not get 20 pairs of black boots, but you might get one really good pair of black boots that lasts four times longer. And so it's a substitution rather than a curtailment. Doing without doesn't work well, but substituting something that is equally pleasurable, even if it's something new, you get over the hump. And this is where other people come in because the opinions of people you know and people you respect have an enormous influence. And that's why if, for example, climate change is important to you, what you think, what you say, um, how you act around other people, this is going to influence them whether you know it or not. P they, those are powerful influences. You know, I don't think you state it explicitly in the book, but I feel like there's a little bit in your own career, you are in a very individual resource intensive career in the way and who you treat. And then there's this big issue of climate change. How did you kind of how do you resolve this too? Or did one lead you to the other? Yeah, uh, it was a real contradiction. And um, I learned this sort of the hard way in my career. I mean, my career is extraordinarily satisfying and rewarding. It's, it's wonderful. It's a real privilege to have this kind of a career where, you know, you have the opportunity to make an enormous impact on, on the lives of a small number of individual people and their families. It's, it's huge. But um, I learned that when patients and families love you, what they really love is that their kid did well. Yeah, they might appreciate how you brought them through the process and how, but usually when they're really, really happy and they tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you. What they're, what they're talking about is how relieved they are about their own child. Likewise, if they hate you, it's usually not about you. It's usually just their own terrible, terrible distress that things didn't go well for their child. And so I learned, uh, you know, being interested in behavior for my whole career, that this career is really rewarding and it makes us feel good. It makes the clinicians feel good. It's about us in many ways. Yes, it's altruism and we love taking care of patients. And, and even if I were like a fly on the wall and never got any thank yous, seeing that kid get better is intensely rewarding in and of itself. But the contradiction between how rewarding this career is and the magnitude of this global problem, uh, that contradiction of the resources uh, that we use for individual patients one at a time, and the big scheme of things in the global sense, that contradiction started to bother me um, pretty early in my career, actually. Uh, and I made a conscious decision that I would transition my career to focus on the big picture problem um, really before I had to give up my career because of, you know, you should give up your career at a certain age. And I wanted to leave myself plenty of time to focus my energies on this big picture problem, because to me, it was sort of a moral issue. Um, it's, it, there's nothing wrong with taking care of one patient at a time. It's wonderful. And it's very satisfying. And I've made wonderful friends, even of my, you know, patients and families that I stay in touch with, but I really wanted to spend time on things that I hoped could affect this enormous number of children all over the world that this problem is going to really create suffering for. So for me, it was a, it was a question of how to use my own energies um, to the best of my abilities.
Great. Okay, I'm going to do some audience questions. We have some really good ones here. So one person sort of on the side of these things says, you know, isn't air quality, isn't the air quality effect and sort of the and water such important issues that it shouldn't be that hard to have collective effort? Why is it so hard? Yeah, it's, it's hard for lots of reasons. Um, one is a lot of things are hard for us to perceive. So we did not evolve the sensors that we would need if we wanted to perceive carbon dioxide. Air quality, we have a little bit of ability to sense, you know, when, when those wildfires, uh, you know, obviously we were in Boston, I'm in Boston now, when the wildfire smoke from Canada came down, you know, you could perceive it and you have been able to perceive it in other parts of the United States and other parts of the world, obviously. So there are certain things we can sense and they're obvious, but there are certain things we can't sense and climate change, while we can sense temperature, the normal temperature fluctuations are such that a two degree difference in average temperature can be difficult for us to perceive the magnitude of the effects of that. So yes, we can perceive certain things, um, air quality, if we're out of water, if you're thirsty, that is a really strong biologic drive. But the time frame of these changes has been hard for us to perceive up until relatively recently and that's because we've started to outstrip our ability to absorb and compensate for some of these changes and they're becoming more apparent so climate change and environmental issues are becoming more apparent to more people which is why the general public's needle has shifted it, you know the people are starting to get that these storms these temperatures these floods these droughts these famines these wildfires are like nothing quite that we've seen before, not individually, but statistically, collectively over, over time. So they're hard to perceive and you'd think it would be easier, um, but it, it creates a challenge for us. Great, there's a question that I think is very succinct and gets to the heart of what your book addresses. So I'm actually gonna read it exactly. Um, they say an obstacle to environmental change is that the cost of going green is focused. Exxon, for example, pays billions to retool while the benefits are diffuse, we all breathe better. Does your insight on decision-making address this inherent problem about who gets economic rewards? Oh man, that is one of the cruxes of the problem, isn't it? It's, it's just, why we are so limited. And, you know, when you think about it, it's so easy to get frustrated. Why haven't we done more about climate change? Why have we been so thick headed? It's for these kind of reasons. This is a tough, tough problem. I've come to think of climate change as the biggest elephant you can imagine, so big you can't even see to the next limb. And we're all touching that elephant with our pinky, with our eyes closed. And what we need to do is fill in all those spaces between our pinkies. This problem is, is really difficult for us. We've not faced anything quite like this. Yes, there's the tragedy of the commons. Uh, there, there are some parallels, but climate change provides some really unique conceptual challenges, informational challenges, whose job is it? Um, you, you know, there, there now are you know, there's the EPA and so forth, but even the EPA in our lifetime, when the EPA was formed, it was formed about pollution. It wasn't formed about climate change. It's such a new problem. Uh, and it's such a problem that most people don't have technical familiarity with. And it's so big that even if you have technical familiarity, you know, you've got, you've got a fairly narrow view for, for, it's very hard to find somebody who has really the big view of this enormous problem. So yes, the economic incentives are something that we're really bad at. We're very bad at prevention in general. We're bad at prevention in public health. You know, we're bad at prevention in, in all kinds of things that affect health and climate change is one more thing. And so we're asking people to attack a difficult problem with no immediate consequences of your, of your decisions typically and nothing tangible and we're asking you to do it for the future. That's a, that's a tough ask. We can do it, we can do it, but it's a tough ask and it, it requires every bit of cognitive input and override of our tendency when we are 
uh, faced with problems that are complicated and make our heads spin to just go rearrange our sock drawer or watch a movie or do something else distracting. It's no fun. Dealing with climate change is not fun. Fun equals rewarding. We have to make it rewarding by, you know, using every bit of cognitive override we can bring to the, to the equation. So we have a, a question that I know your book at least touches on in many ways. Someone asks, how does exposure to nature affect people? Can it make them more likely to favor environmental protection? Yeah, great question. And I didn't know the answer to that. So I had to delve into it. And here's what I found. Uh, in short, exposure to nature is rewarding, but it is not mediated in the same way that a reward is for immediate consumption, like a great meal or, you know, uh, an interesting significant other or, uh, you know, a, a new acquisition of, you know, physical acquisition, new car, new clothes, new house, whatever. Nature is rewarding, but think of it this way. When we were evolving our brains, we didn't really need this exquisite alarm system for lack of nature because nature was always around us. So we didn't have to develop a five alarm fire, you know, system that said, oh, you don't have enough nature, quick, get back in. Because, because those pressures were not working on our brains. However, what we know is that, um, and you know, you can be totally separated from nature and survive. But what we have, have observed is that um, people value nature on average, not everybody to the same extent, like every trait, but that's why people pay more for a house with pretty views. That's why people go on vacations to places, oftentimes to places with, you know, uh, exposure to nature. So exposure to nature is rewarding, but we did not develop such a screaming alarm system that the lack of nature was enough of an incentive for us to say, help, 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 you know, we got to fix it, we got to fix it. Some people feel it much more acutely than others for probably nature and nurture reasons. Um, and as we're losing it, you know, uh, don't it always seem to know, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Um, we, we are recognizing the loss, uh, but it was not a, an acute enough um, uh, stimulus to, to incentivize most of us. One interesting thing I learned is in trying to figure out what the evidence was for what turned people into environmentalists, one of the most important factors in many sort of famous environmentalists was the loss of an important place of nature that they um, uh, experienced early in their lives. And when, when a, that you know, favorite place was destroyed or ruined, that was the tipping point for many people to become environmentalists. So it clearly has a big power, but it's not the same power as acquisition and, and you know, consumption. So here's a million dollar question going back to earlier in our conversation. A member of the audience asks, if information is considered to be true um, from people we know, how do we come up with a source of information that most people trust, which seems to be the problem of our day, whether it's climate change, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's anything? Well, I think you should answer that question, Sharon. You're the journalist. I mean, what happened to Walter Cronkite? <laughs> we, we all say that. And this is one of our problems. Uh, this, is, this is the fear of AI generated information, uh, things where people can get into tighter and tighter echo chambers. I mean, this is not my field. You know, I'm a neurosurgeon. Most of this stuff is not my field, frankly. Um, but how do we get collective uh, uh, information? You know, some of this, it's tricky in the United States in particular, because we believe uh, we, have, we have valued in our society, individual freedom and freedom of speech. Um, we, have, we have been, you know, against regulation of free speech. So many rules, one of the themes of the book, uh, I don't know how much of a theme it is really in the book, but it's something I have come to believe strongly, is that humans um, can adapt to change remarkably well. We are very, very good at adapting to change. But because science and technology 
accelerate because they build on themselves, so they accelerate. Culture tends to lag behind that acceleration. And I actually believe that the acceleration of change has gotten to a pace that it's, we are starting to hit our limits of adaptation to change. And so this question about common knowledge, common belief, this I think is part of what is unmooring people uh, in current society is that they can't keep up with how fast things are changing technically, culturally, uh, socially. And, and we long for something common, uh, something that we have in common because we feel more and more splintered. And then when you add climate change, your very planet, the very earth you stand on, the very air you breathe is changing in fundamental ways in a direction, not just oscillation, but a direction. This is terribly upsetting to people. And so you can understand why people, you know, wanna, wanna block it out. They don't know what to do. They feel helpless. It just makes them feel bad. Climate change makes people feel bad. And so we long for a common authority to tell us what to do, for a common source of data to give us the facts. Um, and, you know, there are news agencies like some that you have worked for or work for, um, like others around the world that, that are attempting to bring common information to people, um, but we can't force them. So maybe to make it rewarding and entertaining, that's the trick. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the answer, but I, I agree that it's a real, it's a real issue. Um, one of the members of the audience asked, what are the most urgent issues in terms of sustainable food systems that impact people's health? I guess I would add and impact climate change. Right. Here's one piece of good news. I've given you a lot of bad news and a lot of sad things. Here's one good thing. Health and climate align. So if you change your diet uh, for either climate motivations or health motivations, it's the same change. So going towards plant-based, and that does not mean you got to eat sticks and twigs. There are many, many wonderful plant-based meals. The average American di diet has way more um, meat protein than it needs. And it is healthier for you to have less meat. Doesn't mean you have to have none, but like you can have a little bit of meat and a lot more vegetables and whole grains. Whole grains, whole grains are just so much healthier for you. They're better for you. They uh, help with uh, weight maintenance. Uh, they have more vitamins and minerals in them. So if you align your diet and your diet comes from agriculture that is also aligned for uh, pro-environmental um, uh, uh, reasons and um, you know, you're not using large scale agriculture with huge amounts of pesticides and so forth, you're using more sustainable agriculture. Um, so for social reasons, for health reasons and for climate reasons, it all aligns. Similarly, if you ride a bike or you walk more than take the car, it's good for your health, it's good for the climate, it's good for the planet, uh, it's just good. It's good, good, good. So the nice thing is that uh, reduction of fossil fuels, it's good for our health, it's good for the planet. So many of these things align with better health. Agricultural changes, um, you know, Decrease, decrease pesticides, increase pollinators, things that uh, don't affect the ecosystems as much, all of these things align. And this is why in climate communication science, one of the most compelling um, persuasive arguments for the general public for things that are pro-environmental is things that are also pro-health. So that is one bit of good news. Well, let me pick up from there and take part excuse me, of an audience question, where they say too many climate change activists assume that fear is the motivator. The evidence seems to point to generating care for the earth motivates people to change their behavior. And of course, you talk about this in the book, it's sort of carrots being good. So let me point to, you know, we do have climate activists. We've seen that out of some of the progressives. Uh, Greta Thunberg is kind of one of the, which does seem to be in many cases fear motivated. Is their messaging could their messaging be better based on science? Could neuroscience help them message better? Right. It would be great if all our motivations came from one thing, you know, it's, it's fear or it's positive reinforcement. You know, 
think of any decision you make, what to have for breakfast, any decision. It is not ever just one thing. It's multifaceted. That's the point of the book. The way your brain actually makes decisions, there are millions of events happening at any one time. And in the book, through the book, there's the story of a politician about to vote on a, on a, on a climate-related bill. And the, the book carries this politician through the entire book until the decision is finally made, talking about the different things that weigh into your decisions. So for an individual person, at any individual point in time, fear or something positive are both at play and one may be more effective than another. By and large, positive works better than negative, by and large. You know, if you look at, if you look at behavioral um, uh, research and even single cell recordings and things like that, you have more neurons that are tuned to positive surprise than you do to negative. And the valence of how a decision can be weighed is more effective by something positive than negative. So, so there is evidence that positive works better than negative, but of course it's variable. There's no simple answer. That said, one of the things I think has been real challenging for climate communicators has been a vision of the future that we can share. And there are several reasons for this. One is it's hard to predict. Two, and this is a tough one, things are going to get worse before they get better. Even if right now all carbon emissions stopped, like I could wave a magic wand, climate change is going to get worse before it gets better, simply on principles of physics. So what we have to be able to do, and this is difficult for us, it's difficult for the way our brains work, we have to think beyond that. We have to realize this is going to get worse, and then we have a choice to make how much worse it gets. It's just like the pandemic. We had choices to make. The pandemic was going to get worse, but how tall that curve got. You know, we talk about flattening the curve, lowering the curve. We had choices about that trajectory. We have choices about the climate trajectory, but we have to be able to look ahead because it's going to get worse, and everything you do is going to feel emotionally because of the way our brains process this kind of information it's going to feel like nothing you did made a difference that's a tough one for us but if you intellectually recognize it's going to get worse before it gets better but i got to get through it and it's going to be better in the future maybe not so much in my lifetime someone at my age but maybe at your age sharon or at other people's age you know it is going to affect your children and your grandchildren. Um, and it is going to affect people around the world that you are never going to see. And, and everything you do will make a difference, but you will only know it intellectually. You will not know it viscerally from direct observation. That's a challenge for us. But if you know that, you can make those choices. So the answer is having a positive vision has, has been, I think, um, neglected. Uh, and it's because it's a little bit uncertain, but I do believe that we can appeal to people's positive view of the future um, and we should spend more time and effort doing that. Okay, moderator's prerogative. We're just about out of time. So last question, I'll make it brief. This has been obviously a process for you as well. What is, how have you applied any of this to yourself or your own decision-making in terms of climate change? Choices you've made or had to sort of rework how your brain is wired. Yeah, well, you know, you feel like a hypocrite if you don't decarbonize your own life, um, uh, you know, get get a, a hybrid or an electric car and, you know, geothermal in your house. Then I can do this because I have the means and resources. Not everybody does. And I, I think that I have in my own life um, tried to do the same thing I've done throughout my career, which is what are the facts? What, are, what does the science say? Co constantly go back to the facts and think about how you could be wrong and also try really hard to keep a global view of this problem. This is not a problem of you know the first world only and uh, our little decisions in our personal lives. Um, I've tried to see how this big elephant connects and what's my role and what's the role of other people I can encourage in this really difficult, big problem. So I think, you know, you try, you try to walk the walk as best you can. None of us is a purist and perfect, 
but I've tried to do what I can to influence other people without being judgmental as best I can, because people make their decisions for very good reasons. We all have good reasons. And if you understand and try to listen and understand where people are coming from, uh, and that this is not an easy problem for us as humans, uh, you can be more sympathetic and maybe more effective. I think we're about out of time. Tina, this was great. Um, I really, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, you're very self-effacing about your work um, on the book. And that's both nice in its own way, but it is, it's a terrific book and that I learned about neuroscience. I learned about my own choices. I learned about climate change. I learned about how people in the medical system think about issues. It's, it's a great read. It's an accessible read. And I think it's a really important read. So I'm glad you Thank did you. it. Thank you, Sharon. And I think we get to go back to Immaculata now. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Sharon. That was riveting, really. And the metric, um, the duck boat metric was fabulous. But I want to conclude by thanking you both, thanking the audience for their questions. And to note that today's program has been recorded and will be posted on the Radcliffe website for information about upcoming Radcliffe programs, including three more virtual book talks and other Radcliffe authors this summer, and to see videos of past events, please visit radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us and take care.